hi. Welcome back to Detective and Mystery Fiction. If you enjoy my content, please consider hitting the like button. It's the only way the YouTube algorithm notices me. This collection features four short stories from the August 1920 issue of The Black Mask. I've added timestamps for each story in the video description. Hope you enjoy it. Brothers of the Coast by J. G. Kofod First published in The Black Mask, August 1920 I dropped over the side of the Mary Rose when she steamed out of Port Royal and swam back to the wharf. It was a foolish thing to do, for the harbour was full of ground sharks, but the heat and rather too much rum and sugar had made me reckless. Probably, too, I had imbibed some of the devil-may-care spirit of this ancient nesting place of the buccaneers. When I reached the dock, I was dizzy and blown from my exertions. It was terribly hot. Something seemed to be dragging at the nape of my neck, and the winking lights in Port Royal Harbour looked like the blazing eyes of mammoth animals. I sat down on a cask and watched the red lantern on the Mary Rose's stack disappear into the night. I couldn't quite recall why I had come back to Port Royal. It was because of something someone had told me, damn that rum. My head was like an empty barrel. I could not remember a thing. After a bit, I lit my pipe, having tobacco and matches safe in a waterproof bag, as all sailormen should. Gradually the fog in my brain started to shred out. I began to remember. First it was Mary Logan. She had promised to marry me back in New Bedford. She had laid her little hands in my great horny ones and pressed her lips against my cheeks, murmuring words of endearment and promising to wed me in a fortnight. All the time she knew she was lying, for her plans had been laid to run away with Benji Harrison that very night. Something snapped inside of me then, the world went black before my eyes. Later I shipped on the Mary Rose, bound for Port Royal, but it wasn't Mary's treachery that had made me leave the old tramp. What was it? I pressed my fists against my aching temples and tried to think. Ah, I had it. It was on account of what Hong Fat showed me, that and the sugared rum, I guess. The filthy, slit-eyed Chinaman was a magician in his own country, he said, and I'll give it to him that he was clever. For two dollars he went through his whole bag of tricks, but it didn't satisfy me. I'm a deep-water sailor, and I come from a long line of blue-nosed, psalm-singing Puritans, but there's a streak of the mystic in me. I always wanted to look behind the veil, and Hong Fat said he could lift it for me, so I gave him five dollars to do it. He brought out a little bronze bowl from under his robe, and made some passes over it with his lean, long-nailed fingers. A thick, oily smoke curled up from it, and almost hid his emaciated yellow face and beady eyes. Then he asked me in his crooked Shantung dialect if I could understand Chinese. I told him yes, rather sourly, for the smoke was making me drowsy. Sailor man, he said in his sing-song way, you are a brave one, a brave man, but you have done enough wrong to offend the gods, wrongs that you must atone for. Wrongs? I said. I've led a pretty rough life, but a square one, and I can't call to mind anyone in particular that I've wronged. I'd like to kill Benji Harrison, but I haven't done it, so you can't call that a wrong. As for Mary Logan, no, I can't call any to mind, I said. What of the smoke there was a tightening around my throat, and my arms and legs had lost all feeling. Hurry up, tell me, what was it when? Not in this life, droned Hong Fat. Long, long ago, the smoke flattened out like a grey screen. There were pictures on it, but so jumbled and twisted at first that I could not make head or tail of them. I seemed to see Mary's face peep out, but I couldn't be sure. Then the pictures began to take shape. Familiar things flashed up. I seemed to be going back into the past, centuries ago, suddenly there sprang into view the old city of Panama, with its houses of aromatic rosewood and the tower of the great cathedral of St. Anastasius. I could see the slave markets, where black men were being sold, while their buyers sat at tables, sipping Peruvian wine. Beyond the city rolled the green savannas, and on one side 
an arm of the sea crept inland. It was the Panama of the old days before Sir Henry Morgan sacked it. I don't know why I recognized it, for the ancient city was gone long before I was born. There is left only a tangle of weeds and sun-cracked limestone. The slave market is a swamp, the haven a stretch of surf-beaten mud, inhabited by pelicans quarreling over the stinking remains of fish. But in spite of that, I saw old Panama there in the smoke, and felt as a man does when he comes upon a forgotten nook. Except for this, at sight of all that beauty, a crawling horror welled up in my throat, and I would have screamed and beat the air, but it was as though only my brain was present. I had no consciousness of a physical body. Men came into the picture. They were muscular and bronzed with the rolling gait of sailors. They wore hats, wide of brim, and running into a peak, dirty linen shirts, and knickerbockers. Around their waists were sashes, bristling with knives, and they carried guns of a make that would seem strange to modern eyes. They were Morgan's buccaneers on their way to the sack of Panama, to pillage and burn and torture and rape. I recognized them, Dubose, with his swagger and black mustachios, squat Sawkins, one-eyed Peter Harris, Ringrose, and then, God pity me, I saw myself, running with the rest, sweat-stained, ragged, but with the lust of battle flushing my cheeks. At the head of the troop was a tall man, with a face framed by lank grey curls, as cruel and evil and ruthless a face as this old world has ever seen. His clothes, of silks and satin and lace, were as weather-worn as those of his men. No need to ask myself who it was. I knew him as I had known the others. Morgan the Damned, the man I had followed in a forgotten century across the blood-smeared waters of the Caribbean. I knew then why Hong Fat had said my wrong was a great one. None could fight under the black flag of this arch-brother of the coast without loading his soul with crime. Sitting there in a dazed trance, I watched the capture and sack of Panama, living over again the wild excitement of that day. The clash of swords on steel casks and breastplates, the priests and nuns whipped before the advance to place scaling ladders against the walls, hate-twisted Spanish faces in the desperate struggle on the ramparts. The final capitulation of the town. The smoke cloud grew darker. The pictures that followed faded as though the scene of torture and outrage were too terrible for the black art of Hong Fat to compass. Through the haze, I saw the Chinaman's yellow face and beady eyes watching me with a sort of sardonic leer. I tried to speak. I fought the air with my numbed arms, but the words would not come to my lips. That is not all, croaked Hong Fat in his weird dialect. There is more. The smokescreen flattened again, as though his claw-like hand had stroked it into a semblance of grey velvet. The figures grew lifelike on the cursed chart. This time it showed the guardroom of the fort at Panama, a room piled high with plunder torn from the ravished town. Through the open casements, I could see the fires of the burning houses, and memory brought back the shouts of the pirates and the shrieks of tortured citizens. There were two men in the room, Morgan, with his fierce, wrinkled face, and I was there. You might think it a trick of the Chinamans, but as each scene flashed on, I recalled it. Oh yes, I had been there, as vile as any of those blood-stained brothers of the coast. And my punishment was stretching through the ages. I hung on each succeeding step, my breath whistling through my nostrils like a foundered horse. Morgan waved his hand, and a woman was led in between two buccaneers. At sight of her, the whole tale came back to me. Her face was the face of Mary Logan dark and proud and beautiful. She wore the dress of a Spanish gentlewoman, and I remembered that back in those fading days of the seventeenth century. She bore the name of Donna Isabella de Guayra, and that I loved her then as I loved her reincarnation named Mary Logan. I had saved her life in Panama before I joined Morgan's crew and had killed her Spanish lover when he found me in her garden. They outlawed me, of course, and I became a pirate to come back to her, the only way that was open for me. 
She swore that she loved me and would wait. When they led her in, my heart blazed. At last, the hour of my triumph had come. There on the smoke screen, Morgan leaned back in his chair, and over the ages, I heard his voice ringing in my ears. This man says, this man says he loves you. Steth, you're worth loving, madame, but why throw yourself away on him when there are better men around? I looked at her, my lips moving. It is not Harry Morgan's way to stand back when there are women or gold to get, the pirate said. You can have him if your love is so strong that it will face death for him. So, sure as you take him, I'll burn you both at the stake. My hand went to the knife at my hip, but I was helpless. The muskets of the two pirates were leveled at me. And, and if I do not choose him, senor? the girl asked. Morgan's face wreathed itself in a terrible smile. If you choose me, I'll cover you with diamonds. By my faith, not a ship on the Spanish main but will contribute to your wealth. So there you have it. Holyoke and death, or Sir Henry Morgan and wealth. The girl's dark eyes flamed into little golden points. He killed the man who loved me, she said. He took a life for his own selfish pleasure, senor. Is it not possible that he will also take mine if I cleave unto you? The buccaneer's pistol was in his hand. Stay with me, and Holyoke dies, said he. Donna Isabella, who in this century betrayed me again, looked me full in the eyes. Her own were hard. I will stay with you, Signor Morgan, she whispered. Then I saw in the smoke Morgan's pistol flame. It was the end for me. Chapter 2 I came to myself with a nervous jerk. The lights of Port Royal twinkled at my back. The Mary Rose had disappeared. How long I had been sitting there on the cask, pondering the strange things Hong Fat had shown me, I do not know. My head felt queer. The dragging sensation at the nape of my neck was stronger. I staggered a little as I walked off the wharf. For how many eons would Mary's treachery be repeated, in reparation for my murder of the Spanish grandee? As the Donna Isabella, she had betrayed me to Morgan. As Mary Logan, she had cast me aside for Benji Harrison, and as surely as we died and were born again, she would repeat that treachery unless... unless I knew Port Royal as well as anyone, but tonight it seemed strange to my eyes, somehow smaller, older, and more cramped. Why this should be I could not tell, unless Hong Fat's cursed smoke still twisted my senses. I followed the crooked street until I came to the Blue Anchor Inn, a tavern huddled under the lee of the old Spanish fort, the very tavern, too, where Sir Henry Morgan had planned the sack of Panama. The night was warm, the doors wide flung, and I heard half a hundred rollicking voices roaring out that melody by the poet of London town, so popular among the buccaneers. In frolic, dispose your pounds, shillings and pence. We'll be damnably mouldy a hundred years hence. Why should they sing that seventeenth-century ballad in the Port Royal of 1920? Controlling, by an effort, the nervous twitch of my muscles, I entered the blue anchor. It was not the room itself, hazy with the fumes of tobacco smoke and smelling strongly of the native rum, that startled me. It was the men sitting around the tables, pounding the oaken tops with their mugs and flagons, and roaring that old carefree ditty. They were Morgan's men, dingy-clothed, scarlet-sashed, heavily armed. God of battles! Was I mad? There sat Peter Harris, with a black patch over his missing eye. Here swaggered Dubose, mustachios bristling, and at the head of the table, Morgan, as savage and ruthless-looking as when he had roamed the main. That had been before the first King Charles lost his head, and this was 1920, perhaps I staggered a bit. At any rate, I stood blinking dazedly through the haze. They saw me, raised their flagons, and shouted, Holyoke! Welcome, old scoundrel. We sail tomorrow for the sack of Panama. I had eyes for none of them but Morgan. 
He lay back in his chair, one fist gripping the pewter mug, his gaze riveted on me. I rested my knuckles on the table and stared at him as I sought to control the quaver that I knew would sound in my voice. My brain hammered like a kettle drum. So tis you, is it? cried the buccaneer captain. Old Holyoke as I live. Yes, I said hoarsely. And what would you have of me, my bold rover? Your life, said I, if I can take it. Are you real, real flesh and blood? If you are, for God, I'll have a knife between your ribs for what you did to me and the Donna Isabella. His voice was dreamy. Donna Isabella? I call her not to mind. There were many women in my life, many, many of them. Harry Morgan's way, you know. At Panama, I shouted. There was a red mist before my eyes. How I hated the man. If I had much to answer for, what punishment could fit his crimes? Ah, yes, at Panama. I tired of her quickly, and she went the way of the rest. But what would you do? I died peaceably in my bed, Holyoke, not on the rack as the Spaniards hoped I would. How can you avenge your black-eyed aristocrat? What can you do to a man who has been dead these two centuries and more? The pirates laughed and pounded their flagons on the table. Something snapped in my brain. The room grew black, save for that lean, sneering face framed by its grey curls. Morgan had thrust back his chair and risen, smiling. I was unarmed, but I rushed at him, all my fear of the man swept away in the passionate urge for vengeance. He carried a long knife in the scarlet sash around his waist. I tore it away, knowing that the man was a ghost and that I could do him no harm. I swung the glittering blade aloft, and then the blackness of death enveloped me. I felt the salt foam on my lips. I, I... Chapter 3 Excerpt from the Port Royal Jamaican A most unfortunate occurrence marred the brilliant buccaneer fate given in honor of the governor last night. An American sailor named Holyoke deserted from his ship, the Mary Rose, which sailed yesterday for Boston. He went to the Blue Anchor Tavern, which had been a favorite resort of Sir Henry Morgan's crew in the old days of the Brothers of the Coast, apparently much the worse for drink. An old Chinaman named Hong Fat had persuaded Holyoke that he was a reincarnated member of the buccaneers who sacked Panama. Everyone present in the Blue Anchor had heard of the hoax. They deluded the drunken sailor into believing that they were all Morgan's men, returned to life. Holyoke apparently became crazed with fear, snatched a machete from the girdle of Lieutenant Buckingham, who was impersonating Sir Henry Morgan, and stabbed himself. Chapter 4 On the same day, the New Bedford Herald told of the suicide of a woman named Mary Logan, who had stabbed herself with a sailor's knife, a curio owned by Benjamin Harrison, and said to have been carried at the sack of Panama by Sir Henry Morgan, End of Brothers of the Coast by J. G. Cofod The Face That Stared Back at Blaisdell by Edwin Carty Rank First published in The Black Mask, August 1920 These are the facts in Blaisdell's queer case, taken from a communication addressed to his best friend, Dr. Maynard Hamilton. Dr. Hamilton vouchsafes no explanation, nor do I. Indeed, there are phenomena in this old world that cannot be explained, as Hamlet pointed out to Horatio in a much-quoted speech. The statements given here were contained in a carefully written paper in Blaisdell's handwriting, which was found in Blaisdell's desk by Dr. Hamilton several days after the man's death. From this paper, he has pieced together the extraordinary narrative that follows. Chapter 1 Blaisdell thinks it must have been shortly after midnight that he fell asleep. Horrible nightmares racked him as he tossed upon his bed, and one of them was so frightful that he woke up with a scream or thought he did. At any rate, he suddenly found himself in the center of his bedchamber, 
dressing with feverish haste. And here is the queer part of the narrative, for he affirms that, while he was dressing, another man lay in his bed, an exact counterpart of himself. This other ego lay quietly asleep, his head on his arm. Blaisdell studied him carefully and said he felt as a locust must feel when he looks at his outworn shell. All the time he was dressing, Blaisdell says he seemed to be impelled to haste by queer promptings that were as insistent as if some person were at his elbow saying, Hurry! Hurry! He finished his dressing in mad excitement and then hurried out of the room, casting a backward glance over his shoulder at his sleeping counterpart. Once outside his apartment house in Gramercy Park, Blaisdell hurried along, his persistent mentor seeming to walk at his elbow. A puzzling feature of this nocturnal prowl was that he felt a sense of familiarity, a feeling that he was on his way to keep an appointment that could not be postponed. The streets were deserted except for an occasional prowler, or a patrolman who made the night echo with sharp blows from his club, as he struck a metal post occasionally to remind the unlawful that the law was abroad. On, on, hurried Blaisdell. By this time, he had lost all sense of location, but he was aware that he was in a downtown section of New York, a section that he had never visited during his waking moments. But, although he knew that he had never been in this neighborhood during his conscious moments, he felt that he was on familiar territory. Finally, he paused in front of an old, three-story brownstone front residence in Washington Square, paused with the air of one who has reached his destination. He walked up the steps and let himself into the house with a pass key. Nor did it seem strange to him that he had a pass key for a house that he had never visited during his waking moments. It all seemed ordinary and commonplace. Blaisdell quietly mounted the stairs until he reached the second floor, and there he paused before a closed door, overcome by a suffocating sense of fear and repugnance. He half turned away, and then retraced his steps as if fascinated. Something seemed to warn him away from that ominous door, behind which lay a mystery that the everyday Blaisdell, millionaire and bon vivant, did not care to penetrate, but which this nocturnal, prowling Blaisdell seemed to insist upon. Then, without any conscious volition on his part, Blaisdell placed his hand on the knob, and the door opened noiselessly. He found himself in a large, square living room, tastefully furnished and lined with built-in bookcases full of handsomely bound volumes. Everywhere he looked, he saw bizarre weapons of defense, and men in Chinese and Japanese armor looked threateningly at him from dim corners of the room. It was either the apartment of an art connoisseur or a globetrotter with a propensity for the unusual. From this room, he stepped into a bedchamber and then started back with a little gasp. It was a luxuriously furnished room that appeared to have been transplanted by Aladdin's wonderful lamp straight from the perfume-scented Orient. Blaisdell advanced further into the room and his feet sank into a wonderful moss-like carpet. To one side of the room was an old-fashioned four-poster bed topped by a crimson canopy. In the exact center of this bed lay a man asleep, with his mouth open. There was something strangely familiar about the sleeper, and Blaisdell drew closer and gazed at him steadily. He was an oldish man with a sallow complexion and a wisp of a beard that was slightly tinged with grey. The ghost of a smile lingered upon his lips, a cruel smile that sleep could not make gentle nor mirthful. And as he gazed upon the sleeper, rage grew in Blaisdell's heart, a rage so furious that it almost suffocated him. Without a moment's hesitation, he seized the sleeper by the throat and began throttling him. The man struggled furiously. His eyes popped open and gazed up into Blaisdell's with a look of freezing despair. A slight froth gathered upon his purpling lips, and he squirmed and writhed like a snake in Blaisdell's unrelenting grasp. God, how he struggled! Blaisdell's fingers sank into the throat as if it were satin, and then suddenly there were no more struggles. The body fell back inertly as the steel-like fingers relaxed. 
Blaisdell pulled the bedclothes over the mask of horror and stole quietly from the room. He felt that his errand had been accomplished. As he went back over the route that he had just pursued, he felt again that weird sense of unfamiliarity that had at first possessed him, and this feeling of strangeness increased as he neared his own apartment house. He walked in and hurried past the sleeping hall boy without waking him. Once inside his apartment, he rushed into the bedroom, but his counterpart was gone. Blaisdell undressed with trembling fingers, but his head had scarcely touched the pillow before he was sound asleep. Chapter 2 A shaft of sunlight fell across Blaisdell's face, and he awoke with a shudder. Ugh! What a horrible nightmare! he said aloud. I feel as if I actually did kill that man. Then he yawned and rang for his valet, after a casual breakfast. He was glancing through the newspaper when he received the shock that changed him from a careless clubman into a nervous wreck. Queer murder in Washington Square. That was the headline he read, and then followed an account of the crime. A private policeman, while going his rounds, had found the front door of an old brownstone residence open and had investigated. On the second floor, he had found another door ajar and, going in, had found a man lying in a queer bed that was overhung by a red canopy. He was about to steal quietly out when something in the huddled attitude of the sleeper attracted his attention, and he then discovered that the man had been strangled, the marks of fingers being plainly visible upon his throat. The police investigation had established the fact that the man's name was Stephen R. Rollins, a famous traveller and authority on spiritualism. He had lived for years in the Orient, and a monograph of his on occult phenomena had attracted much attention in scientific circles. My God, said Blaisdell, as the paper fell from his trembling hands, my God, did I go to that man's apartment while I was in the grip of that nightmare and murder him? Did I? These questions nearly drove him frantic. What should he do? What course of action was there for him to pursue? If he went to the police and told them that he, Herman Blaisdell, descendant of a fine old New York family, had gone forth into the night and killed a man he had never seen before, in his sleep, what would they think of him? They would probably shrug their shoulders and advise him to consult an alienist. And yet this man... This Stephen R. Rollins was dead, and his description, and that of his apartment, coincided in every detail with the place that Blaisdell had visited in his dream. But was it a dream, and who was the other man that lay in his bed as he went out? These questions revolved in his mind like a vicious circle, almost driving him insane. Blaisdell aged after that. He looked ten years older, and his friends were alarmed about him. Dr. Hamilton advised a change of environment and rigorous physical exercise. Otherwise, he would not be responsible for the consequences. The man jumped at every sound and had a mortal terror of the night. He would put off going to bed until the latest possible moment, and then always slept with a light in his room. Sometimes his valet would come quavering to his bedside in the night, frightened out of his wits by frightful screams from Blaisdell. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I couldn't have done it. He would scream, his eyes staring. The thing is impossible. The thing is impossible. When these spells were upon him, he would shake, and it would finally be necessary for his valet to give him a sleeping powder. These things became noised abroad, and he resigned from his clubs, went nowhere, and declined all invitations. He was a broken man, a hopeless hypochondriac, just a morbid victim of nerves or drink, said his friends, and dropped him. Things went on like this for months. And then one day Blaisdell read another item in a newspaper that dumbfounded him. It detailed the arrest of a man named Franklin Sears, who was charged with the murder of Stephen R. Rollins. But he couldn't have murdered him. I murdered him, murdered him in my sleep, mumbled Blaisdell. That afternoon, one of the sensational newspapers published a picture of Franklin Sears. 
and Blaisdell cried aloud in new fright. His valet found him with the newspaper in his hand, mouthing and trembling, his nerves vibrating like a taut piano wire. For the face that stared back at Blaisdell from the front page was his own face. Yet Franklin Sears' name was under it. Chapter 4 Later, Sears confessed to the murder. He told the police that he and Rollins had been chums and college mates. Rollins had fallen madly in love with Sears' beautiful sister and had persuaded her to go away with him under promise of marriage. They had gone to South America, where Rollins had amassed a fortune, and had then visited the Orient. She begged Rollins to make her his wife, but he refused and finally deserted her. A serious illness followed, and she sent for her brother, who promised her that he would not rest until her betrayer had been brought to book. She died, assured that he would avenge her, and he had kept his word, although he had to trail Rollins all over the world before he finally ran him down in Washington Square. Blaisdell followed the developments in the Sears case with absorbed attention. He read the newspapers feverishly and finally decided that he could stand the suspense no longer. He determined to go to the tombs, confront his counterpart, and tell him the story of the nightmare. Surely there was an explanation of it all. There must be an explanation. He had decided to visit Sears the next day when the last queer thing happened in the tragic series of happenings. On the morning of Blaisdell's intended visit, Dr. Hamilton read in his morning paper that Franklin Sears, the murderer of Stephen R. Rollins, had committed suicide in the tombs by hanging himself to one of the bars by his suspenders. The paper commented upon the somewhat unusual fact that the prisoner's watch was found on his body and that it had stopped at three o'clock. It was just a few minutes past three when the body was discovered, still warm. Dr. Hamilton had scarcely finished reading this account when his telephone bell rang. The excited voice of Blaisdell's valet asked him to come at once to his master's apartment, as something terrible had happened. He responded at once, and when he was ushered into Blaisdell's bedroom by the white-faced valet, he saw at once that he could do nothing further for his friend. Blaisdell was dead, and it was very evident from the stiffness of his body that he had been dead for many hours. "'It ain't his being dead that's so terrible,' said the trembling valet. "'It's, it's—' "'Well, look there,' he pointed to the throat of the dead man. "'There was the distinct mark of a rope upon it, "'and this mark extended clear around his neck. "'He—he he couldn't have hung himself,' quavered the valet, "'because I was the first person who saw him, and there ain't any rope.' Some unaccountable impulse made Dr. Hamilton pick up Blaisdell's watch from the dresser. It had stopped running, the hands recording the hour of three o'clock. End of the Face That Stared Back at Blaisdell by Edwin Carty Rank Where the Span Splits by Sam Heilman First published in The Black Mask August 1920 Chapter 1 Tomorrow at 7.32 a.m. I shall have reached the end of my 35th year. I have prepared a program for the morning that I have well considered for 15 years. At 6.30 I shall arise and breakfast with a good appetite. From 7 to 7.25 I shall occupy myself in filling the bathtub and regulating the temperature of the water. It will take at least 14 minutes to get the exact warmth desired. Something between 98 and 99 degrees Fahrenheit. Having completed this task to my satisfaction, I shall go into the living room, place a record of Massenet's elegy on the music machine, and start it off softly and slowly. I shall then return to the bathroom, again testing the water and regulating the flow of hot and cold to maintain the required temperature, I shall climb into the tub. With a razor, I shall cut the arteries in both wrists. This will be done at 7.32 exactly, the hour of my birth and the end of my thirty-fifth year. I shall lie back contentedly and laugh. My body and the water, being in caloric harmony, 
there will be no pain. This I have learned from the Romans, who, of all men, know best how to live splendidly and die luxuriously. To the compassionate music of the elegy, I shall glide and melt into the infinite with the quiet smile of a victor. For I shall have defeated the law of compensation, beaten it as it never has been beaten before. I am not insane. A cringing, spiritless, whining world will doubtless call my act one of an unbalanced mentality. But what care I? I have no reason that society would accept for this deed of self-elimination. I have no financial difficulties, no worries prey on me, my health is perfect, I have not been unsuccessful in love. In fact, as I write this tonight, I am exuberantly and exultingly happy and carefree. When the cat pounces, the rat will not be there. I can picture his look of chagrin. I am putting this on paper, not that others may profit by my example, for I know they will not. Frankly, I am doing it in a spirit of braggadocio. I want a world of rats to know that one rat has escaped the claws of the inevitable. I want it known that the years that are mine I have taken and used to the utmost. The years that compensation takes unto itself I shall not intrude upon. We are quits. We are breaking even. And to break even with it is victory for me, complete, smashing, thorough, and absolute. Even at the risk of being tedious, I shall go into some details, for it is only in this way that the full extent of my triumph can be made plain to a race of futile, unthinking, servile pawns. When I was twelve years old, my father died. He was in his thirty-sixth year at the time. He had been ill for many months with a malady that must have been extremely painful. His groans broke into my sleep at all hours of the night. I often heard him plead with the doctor for morphine. If I only could die, he moaned in his agony. I remember the sufferings of my mother as she nursed him. She had been a pretty and joyous creature, but in those dreadful months, the pink in her cheeks fled before a dead sallowness. The eyes that had once laughed and sparkled with the joy of living lay drearily deep behind dark circles. The luster departed from her hair. A hopeless stoop came into her shoulders, and the shuffle of despondency into her feet. I think I was glad when my father died. I cried at the funeral, not because of his passing, but because of her he had left behind, that broken, crushed mother of mine. At twelve, one is not given much to speculation or introspection, yet I wondered, why had my father been tormented so? His death I understood clearly. That was merely the end, and I knew that all things had to end. But why the torture of his last hours? He had been a kind-hearted, gentle soul, considerate and self-sacrificing. He had worked hard for mother and me. He had given of his substance to the needy and bent a shoulder to the feeble. His life had been clean and wholesome, yet he had been smitten with flaming darts. I could think of no reason. Six months afterwards, my mother died. She too suffered greatly, I know, but so weak was she in spirit and body that no voice was left loud enough to cry her agony. My wonder increased. Why had she been smitten so? I went to live with my father's brother. Uncle John was thin and inclined to irritability, yet he treated me with much kindness, unsmiling but very real. I remember one evening when Aunt Susan had sharply called me in from play to my neglected studies, he had said, let the boy alone with his fun. Later on, he will have troubles enough. Don't rob him of his blessed childhood. And he had sighed. There were two other members of the family, one a boy about my age, good-natured and full of animal spirits, the other an older sister of Aunt Susan, a sweet-tempered, self-effacing little woman who had been born a cripple. One leg was shorter than the other, Congenital hip disease, they called it. I grew very fond of Aunt Stella. Uncle John was troubled with dyspepsia. After each cautious meal, he took pills. They didn't seem to help him much, for I still recall his distress on the few occasions when he grew reckless and tasted of forbidden things. I remember the half-sorrowful, half-envious look in his eyes 
as he watched George and me romp around the place, slide down the balustrades, and in other boyish ways give ear to the call of strident vitality within us. The wistful eyes that observed us as we gorged at mealtimes come vividly before me, even now. One winter's day when the sidewalks were icily slick, Aunt Stella fell on the sidewalk and hurt her bad hip. There was an operation, gangrene, and finally the great emancipation. Uncle, I said three days after the funeral, why did Aunt Stella suffer so? He seemed startled for a moment. Then he answered, My boy, when you are about twice as old as you are now, you will understand. It is the law of compensation. We all must pay for what we take out of life. I questioned him further, but he would not pursue the subject. I didn't sleep much that night. My mind was racing with the problem of compensation but making little headway. In the course of a restless doze, I dreamed that angels and demons were fighting for the possession of my body. The angels seemed to be hopelessly outnumbered and were getting the worst of it when suddenly they came over to the side of the demons and joined them, sticking knives and pitchforks into me. Chapter 2 Life at Uncle John's soon returned to its normal gait. George and I again romped all over the place, although I felt myself a bit subdued and prone to spells of puzzled reflection. My uncle's attacks of dyspepsia continued, and Aunt Susan complained almost constantly of feeling poorly, without any definite ailment as far as I could learn. We had many visitors. Mostly they were men and women in their late thirties and forties. Although much of the conversation was beyond me, I liked to sit quietly in the large living room and listen to the callers. I believe it was during this period that my views relative to the law of compensation took coherent shape. While my foster parents' friends discussed every subject under the sun, there was one topic upon which each and all spoke fluently and often, their ailments. Everybody seemed to have something the matter with him or her. Mrs. Austin had neuralgia, Mr. Hawkins had a heart lesion, Mr. Swift suffered from constant, inexplicable pains in the back, Mrs. Steffens brooded about an incipient goiter, Mr. Holliday was worried about a tenacious cough, and Mrs. Taylor's stoutness preyed on her mind. Of all the visitors, my favourite was John Shelton, a school principal. He had no particular malady except that his eyes gave him trouble. He complained that they hurt when he read at night. Mr. Shelton, I said to him one evening, when we happened to be alone in the living room, do all people get sick when they get to be thirty or thereabouts? He laughed good-naturedly. That's a funny question. Of course not. Why is it then, I asked, that people of that age are always talking about their ailments or looking worried? There's you, for example. Why aren't you happy all the time like I am? Oh, you're young, he replied. You have no cares, no responsibilities. There's nothing to keep you from being contented twenty-four hours a day. That's what I thought, I replied. As you grow older, you get the things that make you unhappy. That's the way of life, he answered soberly. Take my advice, young man, and get all the pleasure you can out of your boyhood. The sweetness of living is now yours. Suddenly he turned with a laugh and said, Paul, do you know where your heart is? Certainly, I said, striking my left side with my hand. You're wrong, he smiled. It's here. He pointed to a spot three inches to the right of the place I had indicated, and two inches lower. Know where your stomach is? I showed him where I thought it was. Apparently, I knew less about the stomach than I did about the heart. I was somewhat ashamed, and told Shelton that we had just started the study of anatomy at high school. Books will never tell you just where your vital organs are, he said, and the longer you remain in ignorance, the better off you will be. When you do learn exactly where your stomach is, it will be the finger of pain pointing it out. Suffering is the perfect instructor in anatomy. Just at that time, other callers arrived, and the questions trembling on the point of my tongue went unasked. Afterward, he avoided the subject of anatomy. 
The next three years passed rapidly, happy, joyous, unrestrained years. My plan of life was rapidly developing. I was determined to squeeze out of existence every drop of happiness it contained before the location of my heart was known to me with exactness. When I was not playing, I observed men and women along novel lines. I read faces for signs of content and unhappiness. I fell into the habit of checking up the number of times I had seen this or that individual in a month. How many times he had been smiling, how many times he had been frowning, how often he had appeared at ease, and how often worried. I did not let these studies interfere with my main program. I sought enjoyment with almost hysterical insistence. I would permit nothing to depress me, nothing to divert me from my purpose. At eighteen, I was sent to college. Because knowledge came easily, I was a good student. Had it been otherwise, I would have quit the pursuit of learning and sought less strenuous occupation. I had a roommate, Arthur Gates, a jolly harem scarum, rich man's son, who worshipped at the shrine of play as feverishly as I. Although he was not lacking in serious moments, he was dumbfounded, I know, when I told him my secret. We had been in the history lecture class together that afternoon, when the instructor suddenly turned pale, clutched his coat lapel, and fell at the foot of his desk. He was a man of about forty and seemingly had been in good health. We helped take him home. I learned that he was a sufferer from angina pectoris, an unusually painful affliction of the heart. In our room that evening, Gates mentioned the instructor's illness. That could never happen to me, I remarked. Why, he asked, have you a guarantee on your heart? No, I answered slowly, but I shall not live that long. What are you talking about? Duckworth isn't over forty-five. When my forty-fifth birthday comes around, I replied calmly, I know I will have been dead ten years. Gates laughed. Been to see a fortune teller, he jeered. No, but on the day that I finish my thirty-fifth year, I shall kill myself. How do you know, asked my roommate, that you won't get angina before you're thirty-five? I don't, but it's hardly likely. The percentage is in my favor. Gates was beginning to be impressed with the fact that I was serious. He gazed at me with puzzled eyes. Arthur, I said, I want you to listen to me for a few moments. What I am about to tell you I have told to no other person and will tell to no other person. I feel that I must unbosom myself to someone. Will you listen seriously? He nodded. I went on. I am now twenty-one years old. I have excellent health, plenty of money, no troubles, domestic or otherwise, and what are regarded as excellent prospects. Yet, I tell you in cold blood that at 7.32 a.m. on April 6, 1920, I shall end my life. That will be the exact hour of my birth, thirty-five years before. Just how I shall do it I do not yet know, Naturally, I shall take the least painful and least unpleasant way. But why? interrupted Gates, who had been watching me with strange fascination. That, I replied, will develop in the course of what I am about to tell you. Understand, I am not trying to influence you in any way. I know that you will not agree with me. When I was a boy, my father and mother both died in great agony. I can see them now, grey with torture, their pallid features furrowed with the lines of suffering and the perspiration of pain on their foreheads. I can still hear my father pleading for death, death that stood outside the door, leeringly biding its time. Afterwards, I lived for many years at the home of an uncle. There, I saw more suffering. I began asking myself these questions, is life worth living? If so, how long should one live? When do the tears of existence begin to outweigh the smiles? At what point in the span do the joys of carrying on no longer balance the sorrows? In seeking answers to my interrogations, I made a close and detailed study of scores of men and women. I watched their faces and searched their souls. I have continued the research at college, coldly and scientifically. 
I have tables and charts and masses of statistics, and the conclusions I reached by observation have been borne out by analysis and precise data. And my conclusion is this, the average life after 35 is not worth living. I saw a Y trembling on Gates' lips and went on, the span of human life is 70 years. In the first 35 we sow, in the other 35 we reap. It is the law of compensation. The pleasures and enjoyment of existence are freely bestowed in the first half of the span, but the bills begin coming in with the 36th year. I have made up my mind not to pay. When the collector comes, I will be out. My roommate shook his head. That's certainly a bizarre theory, he said. It's not theory, I returned. It's a fact, a grim, irresistible fact. As I told you, I have reached my conclusions by way of scientific research. But how, asked Gates, I don't understand. For example, I replied, I have gone to a man of 37 night after night for a month and reviewed the entire day with him. I have tabulated the whole of his waking hours under three heads, joy, sorrow, neutral. Under the first caption, I have listed everything, no matter how trivial, that afforded the subject content or satisfaction. Under sorrow, I have scheduled every disappointment, every ache, every annoyance, no matter how petty, everything he had hoped would not happen, and so on. Under neutral, I have put the things that could not properly be classed under either of the other headings. And the result? In the particular case I am speaking of, there were twice as many notations under sorrow as there were under joy. I conducted my inquiries with a great number of men and women over a long period, and the results were about the same. With younger persons, it was just the reverse. The dividing line seemed to be just at 35. Between 30 and 35, the joys and sorrows about balanced, with a great number of notations in the neutral column. Under 30, the joys and neutrals seem to have the field pretty well to themselves. Often, of course, the law of compensation begins operating lightly, and years may elapse before the victim notices that he is being dunned for payment. But settlement must be made, and it is made through the body, through those held dear, through ambition, pride, vanity, through everything that is cherished and clung to. But I'm going to dance and leave without paying the piper. Gates listened quietly to my conclusion, a serious expression on his face. After a moment of silence, he said, The ordinary person would laugh at you, Paul, and call you crazy, but I believe that I understand you. Boyhood sorrows have merely distorted your views of life. I have no doubt of your sincerity, and I do not question that right now you believe that you will kill yourself when you are thirty-six. Permit me, as a friend, to doubt it. I venture to say that you will be married in 1920, be the father of several children, and would blush and stammer like a schoolgirl if I should happen along and repeat what you have just told me. You are young, and in the next fifteen years your conception of life will undergo a radical series of changes. No, Arthur, I returned, I shall not change my mind. I propose to enjoy the time I have allowed myself to the utmost. At the end of that period, you will read of my death, if you haven't forgotten all about me. That's all. Let's go downtown, have a few drinks and see a show. Gates was glad to go. I never mentioned the subject of my plans to him again. During some of our boisterous celebrations, I often caught a queer smile in his eyes, but he said nothing. After graduation, we separated. Gates went to his home in California while I moved to New York. For a few years, we corresponded loosely and then lost touch. I lived up to my set program. With a generous income, I was able to do about what I pleased. I went where I wished, ate and drank what and where I wanted, and did little work except that connected with looking after my property. I remained free of serious love entanglements. My health continued excellent, and I had no worries. I do not recall an ache, a pain, or a severe disappointment in fifteen years. There was a girl, 
her name is of no moment, a girl of wondrous beauty and celestial character, who did stagger my resolution for a brief spell. When I felt myself weakening, I went to Bellevue Hospital, where I knew a house surgeon, and walked through the wards. The law of compensation was operating on high gear that evening. I finished my tour, had a good laugh, and never saw her again. So this is the last night. I feel strangely happy. For my final repast, I have ordered a royal gorge. I shall dine heartily at midnight and drink many a glass of rare vintage to the vanquished law of compensation. Then to bed for a few hours of calm rest. After that, tomorrow morning at 7.32. Chapter 4 The following letter was received in the coroner's office from Dr. J. P. Sipes. Dear Sir, the enclosed communication or manuscript was found on a table in the room where Paul Traverse died last night. His death was entirely natural and was due, as stated in the burial certificate, to acute gastritis. The attack followed upon an unusually heavy meal he had eaten before retiring. The matter I am sending you was, I presume, a literary effort on his part. End of Where the Span Splits by Sam Heilman Jim Dickinson's Head by Harold Ward First published in The Black Mask, August 1920 Jim Dickinson's Head, pickled in a jar of alcohol, reposes in the dishonoured fastness of a dusty closet in Dr. Wright's office. It has been all of a half-century since I assisted the doctor's father, old Doc Wright, in separating it from its trunk that dark, stormy night out in the weed-grown potter's field. Yet, last night, when I looked at the grisly relic, the face wore the same wolfish grin that it had borne in life. The fangs were skinned back ferociously like the tusks of an angry boar, and the one good eye, the other had been gouged out in a fight years before, glared malevolently, insolently, leeringly, as if, even in death, the owner found a certain grim pleasure in cheating the law, which had declared that head and body must remain intact. Jim Dickinson's body has, in the natural course of events, long been incorporated with the black earth slime from which it came. Over it, the loathsome worms have long since ceased to hold their ghoulish revelry. His filthy soul is without doubt in the hell it created for itself. As for his head, the head he lost to Doc Wright in a poker game, and which the whiskey-sodden old physic dispenser claimed from the grave rather than brave the unspeakable wrath of the dead outlaw, that is another story. Doc wanted the head because of the thickness of the skull, which had withstood, without cracking, a tattoo from the butt-end of a revolver in the hands of a frenzied man and Dickinson wanted him to have it, because it had been fairly won, and the only point of honour he ever observed was the payment of his gambling debts. It is of Jim Dickinson's malformed headland, the black cat with the devil's tempers, and Creole May, the outcast, that this story is written. Chapter 1 Where Jim Dickinson was spawned or whelped, or whatever the inception of an anomaly like him can be called, is a question. My personal opinion is that he was never born, that he was created from the slimy green frog spit that gathers in a scum on stagnant muck, but the preachers will probably take issue with me on that point. At any rate, I know of my own knowledge that there were more maggots of deviltry squirming inside the blackness of his skull than could ever exist in the same space in hell, Jim Dickinson made his first bid for our attention by appearing in Black Peter's saloon one dark, stormy night. A big, hulking figure of a man with a broken, hooked nose and a black, tangled thatch of whiskers. His huge, misshapen head stuck out, turtle-wise, on a thick bull neck. His thin, cruel lips were drawn back in a snarl of vindictive hatred of the world in general, over yellowed fangs so large as to almost appear artificial. One socket was empty. 
from the other blazed an orb, so badly twisted out of shape by the scar from the wound that had destroyed the other, that it looked to be almost in the centre of his forehead, giving him a horrible, ogre-like appearance. There was nothing human about him. He was an animal. Black Peter's den was crowded that night. Finding no open space at the bar, Dickinson made one for himself by shooting, in cold blood, a poor Swede whose place he coveted. Before the murmur of anger and astonishment had fairly started, he stepped across his victim's twitching body to the blood-bespattered bar and downed the liquor which the latter had just poured out. His baleful eye gleamed from under his mop of hair, challenging the world to dispute his right. The Swede was a stranger in the camp, and the ferocious cruelty and simian-like appearance of the Slayer was such as to make the average man think twice before taking up a dead man's quarrel. Where he had come from, no one knew, nor did his attitude towards the world at large tend to encourage familiarity. By that one venomous deed, he became the bully of the camp. From then until his death, he held his sway over the scum of the earth that had gathered there by sheer devilishness and wanton cruelties. He was a thief, a crook, a gambler, and a red-handed killer, a beast, a thing of evil. The only sense of decency he had was in the payment of his gambling debts. He would murder a man in cold blood without a pang of remorse in order to filch from his pocket the money with which to pay a debt of honour. His philosophy of life was as warped and crooked as his twisted soul. And yet, we allowed him to live because we feared him. Take the affair with the gang from Devil's Gulch. Originally, there had been six of them pitted against him, as a result of some mix-up with one of the partners. By shooting straight, Dickinson whittled the number down to three before they caught him at the edge of camp with a bullet through his leg and a horse that dropped dead in its tracks. He had no friends. He expected no assistance. Those of us who were at leisure gathered around to enjoy the spectacle and to see that the strangers handled the affair in a strictly ethical manner. The only tree in that part of the state was a stunted cottonwood, the lower limbs of which were but a few feet above his head as he stood erect. His gun was empty, and he was apparently exhausted. Hence, they attempted to send him into the presence of his maker without going to the trouble of binding him, thinking, no doubt, that he would die game and save them any unnecessary trouble. They were not as well informed on the general cussedness of the man, however, as they should have been, a fact which resulted disastrously for the visitors. For Dickinson, instead of giving up the ghost without a fight, made a mighty leap and seized the lower limb with both hands, taking the strain off his neck. Doc Wright, drunker and more vitriolic than usual, was among the spectators. The dissipated old reprobate chuckled gleefully and hammered the outlaw smartly over the knuckles with his cane. Let go that tree, he yelled. Why the hell can't you die like a man, you yellow dog? You're trying to cheat me out of your head. With the speed of a panther, Dickinson hung by one hand, slipped the noose over his head with the other, kicked one of his captors in the face as he hung there, and vanquished the other two in a fair fight, fists against gun. And when he had completed the job, he humbly apologized to Doc Wright for not allowing them to hang him, so that the bone setter could claim his honest winnings. Chapter 2 To cavemen like Jim Dickinson, love comes but once, and in ways that are peculiar and dark. That he loved Creole May in his own fashion there is not a doubt, and like his aboriginal ancestors, he demonstrated his affection by beating the lady of his choice whenever opportunity offered, and she, recognizing, in the subtle way that women have, that his display of brutality was only a cover for the flame of love that smoldered in his heart, took her beatings, whimpering but uncomplainingly, and, seeking an outlet for her feelings, lavished her affections on Michael. Michael was an ugly brute of a cat, black of fur and short of temper, in short, a feline double of Dickinson. Dickinson hated him with a deep, jealous hatred, hated him because Creole May loved him. With the peculiarity of a woman, she treated her lord with humbleness and humility. 
fighting his battles and cooking his meals in a true wifely way until he laid hands on the cat. That she would not allow. And Dickinson, loving the swarthy strumpet who shared his bed and board, feared to vent his feelings on the animal, lest he drive the female creature from his side. Cheetah, the squaw, who was reputed to be a witch, had warned him against black cats, warned him as she cursed him for the killing of her husband. Dickinson sought to close her mouth by knocking her down, but she refused to be silenced. "'It'll get ye, curse ye! It'll get ye!' she howled, shaking her skinny fist at the one-eyed man. "'A black cat'll be the death of ye! A black cat'll send ye to hell, and will spit at you while you're roasting. Damn ye! Ye spawn of the devil!' In self-defense he was compelled to choke her into unconsciousness, but her screams still echoed in his ears. Nor could he drown them in drink, for the maggots in his head were the kind that alcohol stimulates rather than deadens. We had our priest, Father O'Loughlin, a warm-hearted little chap who sought, with every means at his command, to regenerate the place and bring its inhabitants into the fold. He met with scant success to say the most, but he persisted, and because he was a man among men, measured by men's standards, he gained our respect and love, even though we refused to follow the cross. In some mysterious manner, Father O'Loughlin learned that Creole May had once been baptized in his faith. Immediately, he set about seeking a way to win her back to the church, but she had slipped too far down the scale of righteousness and virtue. She gave no heed to the messages the good padre sent her, time after time, begging her presence at the little church in the valley, with its cross of spotless white. Of two evils, she had been taught to fear Jim Dickinson worse than the threat of hell, and Dickinson, his soul already forfeited to the devil, and his head honestly lost in a poker game, waiting only his death to be claimed, forbade her responding to the priest's appeal. But, to the latter, she was a brand to be plucked from the burning, and after several weeks had elapsed, he determined to visit her in person and appeal to her better nature. For Father O'Loughlin loved humanity, and to him none had dropped so low that he could not be saved. On the evening selected by Father O'Loughlin for his visit, Dickinson, who was violently jealous, having been called away on some expedition outside the law, had taken precautions tending to keep any of May's admirers away from the cabin by planting a bear trap in the dirt just outside the door. To this May submitted dumbly and without bitterness. She was a woman, and her philosophy taught her that a woman is the rightful prey of the man strong enough to take her. The method of taking did not enter into her thoughts. They lived in a tumble-down shack far up the mountainside and approached by a single narrow path, nicked high in the cliff, for Dickinson was a bit of a strategist, and in building looked forward to a possible siege following some new outrage. When she saw the little priest slowly puffing up the path, she realized for the first time that something of evil might result from Dickinson's efficient though brutal attempt to capture his rivals. She was willing to stand his abuse, but sight of the priest brought remembrances of her better days, and over her swept a sense of shame. She rebelled against the man of God, seeing her in her squalor and misery. There was no way to flee, for the path over which he was approaching was the only way from the place, and that path would bring him directly into the jaws of the trap. Creole May, for the first time in her long career of shame and sorrow, was panic-stricken. There was but one door to the shack. To dodge out of it, even in the dusk of the swiftly falling twilight, would betray her presence to the visitor, nor was there a bush or a rock in the vicinity behind which she could take refuge. Yet she could not remain. She was not given to analyzing her sentiments. She had a vague feeling that she was not fit to meet the man who represented in that wild territory the church of her innocent youth. Not for the punishment he might bring for she knew that he brought only a message of love. But as an erring child fears the parent who governs by kindness, physical pain she could endure, 
but she knew that Father O'Loughlin ruled his flock by love, and love, except the love she lavished on Michael, was missing from her strange life. So, like a child caught in some mischievous prank, she peeped around the doorway and watched the head of the priest just appearing over the little knoll. Her foot rested on the chain which, fastened to the bed and dragging across the floor, was attached to the bear trap. To leave the snare in its present location meant injury to the priest. Even if the jaws did not break his leg, Dickinson might return ere she could free him. And Dickinson, in a jealous rage, cared nothing for God, man nor devil. He might even kill the good father. In spite of her fear of Dickinson's vengeance over the removal of his snare, the religion of her girlhood surged forward in her thoughts. Father O'Loughlin must be saved. To think was to act. Hastily grasping the chain, she gave a mighty heave and pulled the trap out of the dirt and dragged it into the house. Pulling down the blanket on the battered bed, she laid the trap on the mattress and laid the covering over it again. Then she dived hastily under the bed, just as she heard the priest's step outside the door. Father O'Loughlin, receiving no answer to his repeated rappings, turned sadly and wended his way back again down the mountain path. With fear and trembling, Creole May listened to the Padre's retreating footsteps. Then, as they died away in the distance, she arose, and seating herself in one of the two broken chairs the cabin afforded, she gave way to meditation and tears, sharing her troubles with Black Michael, her only friend. Dickinson, returning earlier than usual, found the cabin in darkness and May in tears. The moon, shining brightly on the front of the shack, showed him that the trap had been removed ere he reached the spot. With a bellow of rage, he leaped through the open doorway. He stood for a second his single bloodshot eye accustoming itself to the darkness of the interior. Then, with a snarl, he turned upon the woman. "'Where is he?' he demanded, shaking her as a terrier shakes a rat. "'Damn you, tell me, where's the man you had in here?' She attempted to answer, to explain. He refused to listen. The words were choked off in her throat by the pressure of his huge muscular fingers. Then, holding her at arm's length with his left hand, he smashed blow after blow into her face with his right until, tiring, he hurled her into the corner, a dying, battered, unconscious heap. The cat, true to its nature, spit angrily at the invader. Roaring like a maddened bull, Dickinson aimed a kick at the animal. Michael, attempting to dodge out of the crazed man's way, became tangled between his legs. In the darkness, Dickinson stumbled and fell, sprawling across the bed. His huge head struck the trigger of the bear trap hidden beneath the blanket, squarely and with the force of a battering ram. The jaws flew together with a snap, closing about the thick neck with a grip that had been made to hold a grizzly king. Dickinson threshed about spasmodically for a second, his eye bulging out of its socket. His finger worked convulsively. Then, twitching slightly, he lay quiet. On the foot of the bed, Michael, his greenish-yellow eyes gleaming like twin fires, humped his back and spit in accordance with the prophecy of Cheetah. While Jim Dickinson's worthless soul entered into hell, two nights later I helped Doc Wright claim the head he had won and which Jim Dickinson was ready to pay. End of Jim Dickinson's Head by Harold Ward